Good evening to everyone connecting from BC and uh, good morning to, to our panelists and guests from uh, connecting from East Asia. So welcome to uh, our webinar, Discover Canada's Free Trade Agreements in East Asia and British Columbia's support to interactive digital media. My name is Ganna Drost. I'm manager at the Trade Policy and Negotiations Branch at British Columbia Ministry of Jobs, Economic Recovery and Innovation. And before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking today from the territories of Likwangan speaking peoples, the Esquimalt and Sangiz First Nations, whose historical relationship with the land continues to this day. And I hope that everyone is staying safe in this unprecedented times for, for the province. So before we kick off, I'd like to go over the agenda and a few housekeeping items. Our today's webinar will last approximately one hour and will focus on a few distinct areas that will be covered in four presentations. So we will start with a presentation on the BC Interactive Digital Media Tax Credit by the Income Tax Taxation Branch. We will then move uh, to the introduction into Canada's free trade agreements in East Asia and what benefits they provide to service providers in the digital trade. And then we'll jump into export opportunities for gaming sector in South Korea and ASEAN markets by our dedicated BC trade and investment representatives. So our trade representative from Japan, unfortunately, was not able to join us today. But if you have any questions regarding that market, please direct them to me. So we have reserved 10 minutes for Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Uh, please use the Q&A uh, function at the bottom of your screen to raise questions at any time throughout the event. Uh, please try, try to be as specific as possible and also indicate uh, if you, uh, who you are directing your question to. Uh, please note that uh, Derek, uh, BC representative in South Korea, will be taking his questions uh, right after his presentation since he needs to, to leave a bit earlier. And uh, the session today is being recorded and presentations uh, will be made available in the post uh, event email. And if you experience any uh, technical problems uh, or problems with audio, uh, please send me a message uh, directly in the chat. So for those of you uh, connecting from foreign markets, uh, just a bit of background on the BC uh, gaming industry. So British Columbia is home to one of the oldest video game clusters in North America, and uh, it was established in the early uh, 1980s. And today, uh, the province has a thriving game development industry full of large-scale game developers, as well as independent video game studios. The video gaming industry in BC has some competitive advantages, like access to skilled labor force, high quality of life uh, that supports talent retention and recruitment. And BC also boasts a prime geographical location, and competitive corporate and personal income tax. The industry also grew during the pandemic, increasing the number of full-time jobs by 19% between 2019 and 2021. So most importantly, the companies in video game development enjoy strong industry support. And today we're going to cover just a part of it, BC's interactive digital media tax credit. So without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to Mike Weeb, Senior Tax Auditor at the Income Taxation Branch, uh, British Columbia Ministry of Finance, and of course his team for, for their presentation. Mark, over to you. Thank you, Ghana. Uh, we are happy to be here and excited to share some information about a truly great program. I would like to start by introducing the BCID IDMTC team. All right, done something to my presentation here. Ah. Sorry, uh, this slide provides the who and where type information. Of course, to the left is a map of British Columbia and to the right is the team. All of us feel pretty fortunate to be working out of Victoria on beautiful Vancouver Island. Members of the team include Michelle Schley, who is a senior tax auditor and will be walking us through product eligibility. Jessica Zhang, who is an auditor, will be describing program corporate eligibility requirements. And lastly, myself, Mark Weeb, program lead, 
and Senior Tax Auditor, I will be providing some program background as well as describing the process of application for the tax credit. As you can see, this is a small team. However, if you ever apply for the credit or make any program inquiries, you will most likely be directed to one of us. I should note uh, also in attendance today is Zarema Brown. I don't know if you want to wave Zarema. <laughs> she is uh, a relatively new manager uh, for the program, but, uh, but she's doing a great job so far. And we have to be nice to her because she has final say on approval of all applications. So when in doubt, be nice to Zarema. Thank you, Mike. Um, our, general, <laughs> our general contact information is available at the end of the presentation. Uh, next slide. Here we have a high overview of the program. Uh, the program was announced on February 3rd, 2010 and commenced on September 1st of the same year. Now, prior to these dates, we had a team of tax policy staff collect and compare information from similar digital media type programs across Canada, as well as go out and survey a variety of BC based, based video games. This was done to gain a better understanding of how the industry works, what was most wanted, and to understand the characteristics of IDM products. It was based on this research that the legislation and program policy was established for BC IDM PC. Looking at the third bullet, uh, this is a refundable tax credit of 17.5% of eligible salaries and wages. Being fully refundable, amounts receivable would first be applied to any income tax payable, and the remaining amounts are paid to the applicant. Being refundable, there are no carry back or carry forward provisions. And the last bullet, this tax credit is available for companies who are in the business of making IDM products. I'll pass things over to Michelle, who will describe in more detail what the IDM product means for this program. Uh, please take it away, Michelle. Thanks, Mark. Since the program was introduced in 2010, we've seen many new advances in technology. Aside from traditional video games, such as the examples shown, we must ensure consistency and fairness amongst all the products we evaluate. Sorry. Some other types of products we see in addition to the traditional video games include healthcare apps, children's edutainment products, simulators, and AR VR tools. Non-gaming products also need to display characteristics of gaming products. Users must be able to exercise control, receive feedback, and there should be a unique experience for each user. Users cannot simply watch images as spectators. This is not considered interactive. What is an interactive digital media product? It consists of an integrated combination of application and data files that operate together. It's designed primarily to educate, inform, or entertain. It's capable of presenting information in at least two of these forms, text, sound, or images. It's developed in British Columbia. Does not need to be completed or sold to be eligible. Is intended to be used interactively by individuals. How do we determine if a product is used interactively? If a product isn't a traditional video game, we evaluate for gaming characteristics and features. Feedback is the response given to the user based on their actions, such as whether a selection was correct or incorrect, a ding sound or a buzzer, or an image displaying the result. Control is the degree of control the user has when using the product, such as selecting answers, choosing objects, or creating characters. Adaptation considers the product's response to the user's level of ability. This can be more difficult to assess. We look for ways the product adapts to the user's interactions, such as consequences for success or failure, suggestions or hints given, or progression to a higher level of difficulty. Also, we consider if there is a unique outcome for different users. For first time applications, we usually make a site visit to have a meeting with the applicant and observe the work being performed in the studio. This may include demonstration of some or all of the products claimed. This is an opportunity for us to see the work you do and for you to ask us questions about the IDMTC process. During the pandemic, we have held video conferences and phone calls to discuss applications and answer questions. Now, Jessica will explain the corporation requirements for the IDMTC. Thank you, Michelle. To be eligible for the BC IDMTC, the applicants must meet both the corporation and product requirements. Michelle has outlined what the product requirements are 
I will explain the cooperation requirements. To be eligible for IDMTC, a corporation must meet the following requirements. Has a permanent establishment in BC. Permanent establishment means a fixed place of business, which includes an office, factory, or workshop in BC. Is a taxable Canadian corporation throughout the taxation year. Has at least $100,000 eligible salaries and wages. The eligible salaries and wages will be prorated for short taxation years. A corporation must also have eligible salary and wages that are one, at least one million dollar or uh, sorry, two million dollars or two are between one hundred thousand dollars and two million dollars and either a is uh, principal business is developing interactive digital media products, or B, all or mostly all of its business consists of providing eligible activities to eligible corporations. Principal business means more than 50% of your business is developing complete IDM products. 2B usually applies to service providers. At least 90% of their business must be providing eligible activities to BC companies who will be qualified for BC IDMTC. I will explain what considered as eligible salary and wages later. If applicants meet all these requirements, the corporation requirements will be met. A corporation is not eligible if it is exempt from tax or has taxable income exempt from tax. Is a labor-sponsored venture capital corporation? Is a registered employee venture capital corporation or small business venture capital corporation? Is controlled directly or indirectly? in any manner by one or more of the above corporations. Claims a BC scientific research and experimental development tax credit is also called the BC Shred tax credit, carries on a personal services business. One thing I would like to point out is applicants may claim both federal Shred tax credit and BC IDMTC but not BC Shred Tax Credit and BC IDMTC. If a corporation is one of the above, then the corporation requirements are not met and thus it will not be eligible for BC IDMTC. One of the um, corporation requirement is eligible salaries and wages must be at least $100,000. So what are eligible salaries and wages? They must be directly attributed to eligible activities incurred by the corporation in the tax year and paid to individuals who were resident in BC on December 31st of the year preceding the end of the taxation year claim. In summary, eligibility of salaries and wages expense are amounts that pay to the employees of the corporation and the employees must be BC residents at the end of previous year and the tasks they perform must be directly attributed to eligible activities. All three requirements must be met in order to be considered as eligible salaries and wages. I will explain what eligible activities are in the next slide. The eligible salaries and wages do not include stock options, amounts paid to specified employees based on profits or bonuses, or are in exceed of five times the year's maximum pensionable earnings. A specified employee is an individual who owns directly or indirectly 10% or more of the issued shares of any class of the capital stock of the corporation. Amounts paid to contractors or subcontractors are also not considered eligible salaries and wages. All these amounts must be removed from the eligible salaries and wages. 
any assistance we see we sorry um okay so sorry um so what are eligible activities eligible activities are activities that are attributed attributable to development of an idm product examples are design arc work animation and project management amongst pay to employees who are working on eligible activities can be included in eligible salaries and wages. Eligible activities do not include marketing, human resources services, administrative services, or management services. Do not include amounts paid to in employees who are working on these activities in the eligible salaries and wages. Any assistance received by the corporations for the tax year must be deducted from the eligible salaries and wages. Not all assistance need to be removed. Only those received for the eligible activities in respect of salaries and wages for the tax year must be deducted. Examples are Canada Media Fund, Industrial Research Assistance Program, student training grants and supports received during COVID-19 pandemic. Federal shred tax credit is not considered as assistance, so it does not need to be removed. Next, I will pass on to Mark and he will guide you through the registration process. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, so now that we've covered IDM products and eligibility requirements, we move on to the process of actually applying for the program. This program is jointly administered between the BC Ministry of Finance, that's us, uh, and the Canada Revenue Agency, often just called CRA. Uh, so if you want to take away from this slide, hopefully it's that applying for this tax credit is a two-step process for each year of application. Corporations first apply to the BC Ministry of Finance, who determine eligibility. Uh, if a company is determined to be eligible, the applicant receives a registration number. This leads to step two. Uh, the registration number is used by the corporation to complete schedule 429 when making a claim with CRA. Uh, to summarize, once that registration number is issued by the Ministry of Finance, program and product eligibility is no longer an issue. Uh, as part of step two, CRA focuses more on claim amounts uh, made by the applicant to ensure they are correct. Uh, it's not noted on this slide, but it's an important uh, uh, note. Uh, there is an 18 month filing deadline at the end of the tax year. Uh, this deadline must be met by the applicant uh, with both the Ministry of Finance and the CRA organizations. So this slide has more of a focus on the first step of the registration process with the Ministry of Finance. As you can see to the right, there's a screenshot of the eTax BC website. The only way to apply for registration for BC IDMTC is by using the web-based application. This uh, first step with eTax BC is to enroll for an account. Once this is complete, an enrollment letter is sent to the applicant by mail, which provides information needed to access that new account. The web-based tool is really a one-stop shop where you can apply for the tax credit, provide any third-party represent, uh, representative information if applicable, submit all required supporting documentation, as well as pay the annual application fee. Uh, it's worth mentioning that when you're accessing your IDMTC account and completing all that information, you can stop and save your progress at any time and come back to it when convenient. Okay, as mentioned, uh, there is supporting documentation required for each claim. Uh, this is a simplified list, but more details are available on the BC IDMTC website. Commonly required documents include a uh, copy of the financial statements, a short history of the corporation, uh, the current business plan, a list and description of all current and planned IDM products for the tax year, including screenshots if you have them. This is probably, for me, it's the most important point because uh, really it's, we're looking at what the company did for the year. Uh, the current organizational chart, a list of specified employees and key employees, a salaries and wages allocation schedule, product allocation schedule and description of any assistance received by the corporation for the year. The main thing, as I mentioned, is we're trying to determine from all this is what did the company do? What do they develop? And do they satisfy all those corporate requirements? As a final comment on this slide, it's okay if, uh, if an applicant misses any given document or documents listed here, 
Uh, if we need more information, we just simply ask for it. All right. There is an annual application fee as noted here. Uh, the fee is based on the number of employees at the end of the prior tax year. So zero to four employees equates to a fee of $1,000. Five to nine employees is $2,500. 10 or more employees equates to a maximum fee of $5,000. Something to note, for any companies in their first year of operations, uh, the fee would automatically be $1,000, regardless of the number of employees employed for that first year. These application fee payments are really best done using the eTax BC tool. Other methods, methods include submitting a check by mail or courier or paying through your bank or financial institution. However, these there can be delays or more reconciliation steps related to those last two steps or options. So we encourage all applicants to use the eTax BC for payments if at all possible. And last slide is our contact information, pardon me. It includes our phone number, which is 1-877-387-3322. Our email, which is itbtaxquestions at gov.bc.ca. Or our website, which is gov.bc.ca forward slash digital media credit. As a final comment, I can speak for the team when I say we really want applications to be, we really want applicants to be successful in application. So if you really aren't sure about your specific eligibility, please contact us anytime to discuss before you actually apply. Well, I should also mention that that phone number is only within Canada. So if you are uh, uh, inquiring from outside of Canada, just send us an email first and we, we, we can start the communication that way. Um, yeah, I think that's all we have. And I think, I hope uh, some people have questions for us. We're happy to entertain those, but I think they happen at the end. I, I will pass things back to the capable hands of Canada. Thank you so much, Mark uh, and uh, Jessica, Michelle, thanks for this very informative presentation. Uh, I already see some questions coming in the Q&A uh, box, but uh, uh, yeah, as we mentioned, I encourage everyone to use the Q&A uh, box to submit your questions and we'll be taking them at the end uh, of the presentation. Uh, so now let's move on to the... to the uh, presentation on Canada's free trade agreements in uh, East Asia and opportunities for uh, digital services sector. So before we do so, uh, I just like to say a couple of words uh, about the branch I work at. So the trade uh, policy and negotiations branch represents BC interests in both international and domestic tra free trade negotiations, as well as in trade disputes that affect BC. And uh, we also do FTA outreach sessions like this webinar to ensure that um, the information uh, on how to take advantage of these free trade agreements is widely known. So here is a quick overview of my presentation. Uh, I'll start off with welcoming remarks by our Minister of Trade for Trade, and I'll talk about Canada's free trade agreements in East Asia and key opportunities uh, they offer to companies like you. So BC uh, Ministry of Jobs, Economic Recovery and Innovation uh, aims to make life more affordable for British Columbians by building a strong, sustainable economy and improve the standards of living. And there are many ways to foster this economic recovery and growth. And one way is to encourage you, businesses, to leverage the opportunities found in free trade agreements and diversify your export markets. And this is our job today. So with that, I'd like to kick it off with a short welcoming video uh, from the Minister of State for Trade, who will explain what support is available to you. So bear with me while I'm sharing the, the video. Hello, I'm George Chow, Minister of State for Trade. I'm pleased to add my support and welcome you to this session. The goal for this session is to share the benefits and opportunity of Canada's domestic and international free trade agreements, and to ensure that everyone in BC's diverse regions, communities, and sectors receive the information needed. Free trade agreements help open new markets as well as advance and protect BC's competitive advantages. They are a critical part of attracting new investment into BC's regions. They apply to all sectors of the economy, including forestry, agricultural, 
intellectual property, clean tech, and mining, to name just a few. I'm proud to say that last year, we held close to 50 information sessions like this one with approximately 1,500 participants covering all of BC's regions. We have also held sessions for Indigenous businesses and women-owned businesses. Now, because of COVID-19, we are continuing the webinars and my hope is we can resume in-person sessions when the time is right. The COVID-19 pandemic has made international trade much more challenging for the foreseeable future. Thankfully, the very good news is Canada has 14 free trade agreements covering 51 countries, including a new Canada-US-Mexico agreement and agreement with the European Union, Japan, Korea, and many others that, if used correctly, can help lower your costs and provide much needed certainty in these uncertain times. Free trade agreements are complex. My staff are here today to help you understand how they work. I want to ensure that you are supported as you plan for the future. We are also offering help with export and trade readiness through our Export Navigator program. And we have in-market experts and other resources available in Canada that you will hear about today. I wish you all a successful info session. Thank you. As the minister has mentioned, Canada has a first mover advantage. And to this day, uh, Canada has actually secured 15, already 15 free trade agreements that cover 49 countries. And Canada also has two domestic free trade agreements. So those agreements, they give you access to nearly 90% of export markets uh, or about 1.5 billion potential consumers worldwide. Free trade agreements have different coverage and some cover only goods, while others cover trade in services, uh, in financial services, in investment, and also government procurement and temporary entry of business people. So these are usually the later trade agreements, such as Canada-US, um, Mexico trade agreement, or CETA, uh, Canada agreement with the European Union, uh, CKFTA, and uh, the CPTPP, the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. And today I'm going to talk about the two latter ones. So let's start with the Canada-Korea Free Trade Agreement, CKFTA. Uh, Korea is the world's uh, 11th largest economy. It is also the fourth in Asia, and uh, it was BC's number four market for goods exports in 2020. With a population of, of more than 50 million and GDP of more than 1.5 uh, trillion uh, US dollars, Korea is a large market with ample export opportunities. And Korea also has a growing middle class, and uh, it's a gateway to emerging and fast growing markets in Asia. Uh, CKFTA was Canada's first FTA in Asia Pacific, and it entered into force in early 2015. For Canadian goods, average Korean uh, duty of 13% applied until CKFTA entered into force. And also before the CKFTA, uh, BC and Canadian companies were at a disadvantage because the US and the European Union already had trade deals with Korea. And uh, this was an important deal for putting you and other Canadian businesses uh, on a level playing field with many of your international uh, competitors. So now let's move on to the CPTPP, uh, so the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. It is one of Canada's uh, most recently implemented FTAs, and currently it is in force for eight members. Canada, Australia, Japan, Mexico, New Zealand, Singapore, Vietnam, and recently Peru. Uh, BC through uh, Canada is on a level playing field with those uh, that have already preferential uh, access in the CPTPP markets and has a leg up on those uh, who do not have access uh, at the same uh, level. So, but this preferential access will not last forever since uh, the CPTPP entered into force. The European Union has already entered into free trade agreements with Vietnam and Japan and is currently uh, in trade negotiations with uh, Australia and New Zealand. And I would also like to emphasize that uh, the CPTPP trade area may expand over time. 
Uh, the United Kingdom is currently negotiating its accession, and uh, you might have heard that China and Taiwan recently submitted their bids to join the agreement. And there was also Thailand and uh, South Korea who expressed their interest uh, previously. And there have been some uh, signals from the US. Uh, they might also reconsider uh, consider joining, better say, the CPTPP down the road. So now let's talk how these free trade agreements actually facilitate trade for service providers like you. So I will not go into too many details, but we'll try to keep it uh, on a high level. So first let's define what, uh, what service means. So your uh, product or uh, the uh, service that you uh, sell is something that you can't drop on your toe. So when it is, a, say, a video game uh, that you sell to your business partner or client and you transmit it electronically, not on a USB drive or, or a disk, for the purpose of Canada's FTAs, it is considered as a service or a digital good that is transmitted electronically. And vice versa, when you sell a video game on a Switch or cartridge for console gaming, then this game would be considered as a good and the good provisions of free trade agreements will apply. So both agreements, uh, CKFTA and CPTPP, seek to facilitate uh, the trade in services by providing enhanced uh, predictability, transparency, and uh, leveling the playing field for service providers. And provisions of services such as video games uh, are covered by free trade agreements, by these free trade agreements. And in both agreements, uh, the core ob obligations related to services uh, are that uh, your service should not get worse treatment than other providers of services from other free trade agreement markets or the world trade organization partners. And this um, commitment is known as most favored nation treatment. You also should benefit from the same treatment as other domestic service providers be it in South Korea or in the CPTPP markets. And this is known as a national treatment. Countries should not impose restrictions on the quantity or types of entity that can supply services. So this is known as market access. Uh, then there is also local presence. Parties agreed not to require companies to have a local presence in the market as a condition of doing business. And there is temp temporary entry provisions that make it easier for you to enter markets temporarily as a business visitor, an investor, or a highly skilled professional. And temporary entry does not replace the visa process. That's important to note. But uh, you, might, you might also need to remind the border officials of the CPTPP uh, entry into force and uh, have a detailed information at hand. Uh, for example, in the case when you don't need a visa to a CPTPP market, you might need to provide this uh, proof that you are visiting on a business purpose and that it is covered by the free trade agreement. And of course, there are some exceptions, but I'm not, not going into, uh, into too many details today. So on, the, on this slide, uh, you can see some of the FTA's provisions that pertain to the ICT and tax sectors and uh, seek to facilitate a trade through the use of the internet. So uh, here are several agreements that are compared, uh, KUSMA, CPTPP, CKFTA, uh, CETA, uh, and also Canada-UK uh, trade agreement, uh, continuity trade agreement. So uh, you can see that key commitments for digital trade uh, and trade in digital goods and services listed in the left column and FTAs are at the top row. So green check mark indicates that uh, th there is a binding provision in the FTA and red cross implies that the provision is not specified in an FTA. So all agreements foresee 0% uh, custom duties uh, or other charges on digital products that are transmitted electronically. For example, it can be video games, as I've mentioned, uh, software, uh, eBooks, uh, videos, music. Uh, all listed agreements also facilitate digital transactions by permitting the use of electronic authentication and electronic signatures. FTAs also protect consumers and uh, businesses' confidential information and uh, guarantee uh, foreseeable consumer protections in the digital marketplace uh, and require application of uh, IP enforcement measures in, to the digital environment. 
CUSMA and the CPTPP uh, eliminate localization measures on the data uh, storage and processing. And some trading partners have also agreed uh, that they will not demand access to proprietary software source code or uh, algorithms. And you'll see some more provisions uh, in this table. Also, the digital uh, chapter usually includes cooperation and dialogue for uh, dialogue mechanisms, so for parties to uh, to allow to address any arising issues that have not been specified in the in the agreement. So, what also might be relevant to you are investment commitments. Both the CKFTA and the CPTPP uh, seek to maintain a predictable, transparent, and rules-based uh, investment climate, and it works both ways whether you are planning to invest into the CPTPP or South Korean markets, or whether you are a potential investor that is getting ready to invest in British Columbia. So many of the investment provisions, they mirror concepts I just uh, went over for services, such as most favored nation treatment. If one of the parties, for example, gives an investment from another uh, country better treatment, they will apply um, it to Canadian investors or uh, CPTPP or Korean uh, investors in Canada as well. And then national treatment as well, parties will treat uh, each other's investors uh, no worse than their own. Uh, there are also minimum standards uh, of uh, treatment on how investors uh, will be treated. So the rules around performance, for example, uh, performance requirements, so parties cannot uh, impose certain conditions on, uh, on an investment, for example, by local or uh, any performance requirements. And uh, covered investments are also protected from expropriation or nationalization. And uh, investors can freely transfer capital and profits related to an investment into and out of the host country. Um, and then there is a dispute resolution mechanism in both uh, CKFTA and the CPTPP. And they can be used uh, if an investor believes that they uh, or their investment uh, undertaken were discriminated uh, against. Uh, by the host party. But again, there are some exceptions and some reservations to that, but this is on a, on a high level. And here is just a quick slide uh, before I give a uh, floor to my uh, colleagues uh, in trade and investment representative offices. So we all need to adapt to an international trade landscape that is continually changing. And it can sometimes be tough to know uh, what's going on in a market halfway across, across the globe. Uh, and uh, let alone connecting with uh, someone uh, you can trust to do business with. So that's why uh, the network of BC trade and investment representatives uh, shown on this map has, has grown to 16 offices covering uh, all of our major markets and uh, the role of uh, trade uh, representatives um, in, from BC is to help international businesses discover the benefits of British Columbia as a destination for investment and uh, partner for trade and innovation and uh, source of quality goods, services and resources. But uh, they also help BC businesses to contact potential buyers, investors and other partners in global markets. So I will, uh, I will stop here. Uh, and uh, I know it's been a lot of uh, a bit of technical information in this short period of time. So I will just close by saying that uh, we continue to support uh, people and uh, BC businesses in recovery from the pandemic uh, by assisting with leveraging opportunities in free trade agreements. And if this is something that you are considering, uh, please get in touch with me and I'll make sure that uh, you get the information and the assistance that you need. And now without uh, further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Derek Kim, uh, Senior commercial, uh, commercial Officer at BC Trade and Investment Office in South Korea for his portion of presentation. And just to remind you uh, that Derek will, will be taking your questions right after uh, his presentation as he needs to, to leave a bit earlier. So Derek, uh, over to you. Thank you, Donna. Just pop up my um, presentation here. Okay. Okay, can you... Can you see my slides here? Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you so much for the opportunity for me to present um, market opportunities in South Korea. My name is Derek Kim again. I'm the Senior Commercial Officer for British Columbia Trade and Investment Office in South Korea, co-located in the uh, Canadian Embassy in Seoul. So there are three things I'd like to cover today, which is market overview and the opportunities identified, 
and some of the questions answered that I can answer in the end. As you can see, Korea is um, one of the largest trading partners and uh, in between British Columbia and, and even, in the, even in the world. South Korea especially is the world's fifth largest gaming market with $18 billion per annum. According to Korean uh, Creative Contents Agency, um, mobile accounts for 50%, roughly $9 billion Canadian dollars, followed by PC, 31%, console games, 4.5, and arcade, 2.1. Uh, this is a similar trend as of the, uh, that of the global game market, which we see uh, about 48% of the market shared by mobile games. In terms of the types of games that are favored in Korea market, uh, role-playing games, followed by first-person shooting, and then real-time strategies. Impacted by COVID-19, mobile and consoles are growing rapidly as PC, uh, PC games are being a little bit stable. Some of the key players in Korea, as you probably know already, uh, in Korea, there's um, what we call as the big three, Nexon, NCSoft, and Netmarble. Nexon is known for FIFA Mobile MapleStory with 33.95 billion market cap and 3.34 billion revenue in 2020. Uh, NCSoft is known for Lineage and Guild Wars, and therefore um, they're about $25.15 billion market cap and $2.64 billion revenue. Then Marble comes third. They're known for BTS World, Marble, Lineage 2, and they're at $12.58 billion and $2.83 billion revenue. So those are the three big players, and some of the other players include Battlegrounds, Crapton, Lost Ark's Smilegate, Lillian's Kakao Game, Black Desert's Purvis, and Ragnarok of Gravity. Some of the opportunities in South Korea I'd like to suggest to you. Um, first off, there are 70.5% of the Korean population is considered as game players with play time about 49 minutes per day. Top users are identified as male in age 10 to 20, 18%, then in their 40s, 15%. Average revenue per playing ga uh, paying gamers in Korea is the highest in the world. Most of games are free to pay, but also they are high spending per person. With one of the fastest 5G internet and most connected network, uh, which enables Korean game players ever more immersive play. So there's a preference right now with the streaming online than download games. Current opportunity I see in the market right now, uh, first off, the, almost 80% of the users uh, use mobile, mobile phone to play games, especially due to social distancing. Um, second point is really crucial. Uh, so the President Moon, which is, uh, he's the president of South Korea, said, culture content will be the conscious power of development for the next 100 years, meaning that governments are uh, really uh, supporting this digital contents uh, area, which is on the rise with the game development. You know that there are a lot of YouTube game watching influencers, uh, which are uh, that they are collaborating with game developers. Also, there are a lot of collaboration between K pop artists, such as BTS World, K dramas and movies, as you know, the famous Parasite and Squid Game, is only a natural progression with the game development. Post COVID, uh, we see there's opportunity for esports. Korea is the, was the first country to host esports with a stadium and park devoted to esports in Pangyo. And since then, the game, um, Korean government is seeking to enter the with Corona mode, softening the measures against PC Bang and the game arcades, who suffered greatly during the COVID. And now we are really looking into the new era. Uh, going for the esports. So the government has recently passed a law for uh, to financially support local governments to organize their own sport games and some tax reliefs to corporations. Into the uh, future outlooks, we see that the Korean IT and gaming companies are collaborating to release blockchain games, such as in case where Kakao, um, with incorporating augmented reality, virtual reality, and heading towards metaverse with non fugitive token NFT attached. We see the case uh, point for uh, NS NCSoft, stock price spiked 30% amid plans to launch NFT games in 2022, very recently, a couple months ago. Uh, G-Star, uh, this is a large gaming related trade show in South Korea, which happens every November. And with the major local operators such as NCSoft, Han Game, Kakao Games attending. Myself included right now, this is the reason why I'm just dashed out as soon as 
uh, my presentation is over. I am currently at GSTAR in Busan uh, with our colleagues and uh, our Canada Pavilion, BC Pavilion. And uh, we are currently representing three companies from BC, CyberSpline, uh, MCG, and HyperHippo. Uh, this is a hybrid show with the online portion, matchmaking platform with integrated video conferencing as well. So I highly encourage you to attend next year. Some of the opportunities I see in Canada is the fact that BC is kind of this digital super cluster, which is the brand presence we can definitely talk to investors overseas. And some of the success stories that I that came out from our office in the past is the fact that Kabam in Vancouver was acquired by Netmarble through a 900 billion investment in 2017, which was the one of the record high investment into the province. Subsequent to the acquisition of Kabam, the company has expanded its business in Canada by acquiring two more studios in Quebec. Kaban Montreal and Ludia. All the subsidiaries are game development studios and publishers exporting their games globally. Also in 2021, our office has helped Purvis, which is one of the key players in Korea to establish their own first North American gaming studio in Vancouver, looking to invest $20 million. So lesson learned here is BC's digital contents attract many investors, including game publishers to collaborate. Our strategic location close to major markets in North America is to our favor. So I highly advise you to reach out to those companies that have presence in BC, in Vancouver to uh, seek for poss possible partnerships. Uh, that's it from me. Um, if you have any questions, I'd like to take them now. Thank you so much, Derek. Thanks for this informative presentation. Um, so I encourage everyone to send the questions in Q&A panel and uh, just a question probably from me uh, for now. Uh, Derek, what uh, would be um, like your uh, view, what is the impact of COVID on the gaming industry in, uh, in South Korea? I know you've mentioned that uh, there was a shift uh, that you saw uh, to mobile gaming, but uh, I was wondering whether there, there is something else that you could add on that. So um, thank you for the question. and. As I am currently physically in uh, G-Star right now, I've seen a lot of uh, trends that's going on in Korea, uh, uh, midst of uh, our COVID situation. So there are a lot of um, trends that uh, a lot of game publishers are going for um, collaboration, as I mentioned, with the uh, contents and media. So they're looking at um, incorporating with um, you know, other tech companies, as I said, with NFTs or blockchains. So the futuristic technologies incorporated into the game so that um, they're more globally connected and also leverage upon the current situation with the COVID. Um, despite the COVID, as that's we um, you know we've seen some growth in BC and so as in Korea. So COVID is not really such a um, drastic thing, I guess, for the game industry in Korea. But it's it's they see it as more more of an opportunity to grow grow outside the box. So I've seen a lot of um, growth in Korea for the mobile games development, also collaboration with the foreign uh, contents um, and IP owners. So uh, this is definitely something that you should also think, try to think out of the, outside the box to move ahead. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Derek. Uh, thanks a lot for, for this, for your input. Uh, so I don't see any questions coming, but if there are anything that will pop up, we'll make sure that uh, these questions reach, uh, reach you. And uh, yep. without further ado, I already see that we are a bit behind the schedule. So um, I will hand it over to Lisa, uh, to Lisa, our senior um, commercial. Thank you so much, Derek. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Gunnar. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. So, uh, uh, okay. Lisa, our senior commercial officer at the BC Investment Rep uh, BC Trade Investment Representative Office in uh, uh, Singapore. So, Lisa, I'm just about to start sharing your presentation, and uh, here we go. Okay, thanks, Ghana. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Lisa. I'm a representative of Trade Invest British Columbia based in Singapore. So very happy to be here today to give you a brief presentation on the gaming industry in the region. So, you know, gaming industry is one of the fastest growing sectors in Southeast Asia, and the market size has increased by four times in the just past five years. Um, so let's take a look at some trends that we see in Southeast Asia. Um, it's on the upper side of the slide, um, actually some already mentioned by Derek. Uh, so sorry for the uh, overlap. 
Um, as you can see, um, mobile gaming is um, currently the dominant form of online gaming. So for many publishers and uh, developers trying to find um, success in markets, so mobile naturally became a sensible entry point. Uh, one is because it's simpler you know, for them to develop mobile titles. And also for consumers, they don't need to invest in um, a PC or console because they already have a mobile anyway. Um, and second trend we see here is cloud gaming. So it's kind of like streaming. You don't need to like pay for individual games and then download and install on your device. Um, also, you know, we the launch and development of 5G network that we, has already begun in some countries here, like Singapore, Indonesia, and Malaysia. So this will just drive for further growth of cloud gaming. And another trend that has also been filling the games market in the region is the rise of esports. Um, so it also affects esports related video content, uh, which is becoming very popular here. And you know that actually Asian Olympic um, Council has even added um, esports to its list of disciplines for um, the 2022 Asia Games in China. So now moving on to challenges, um, you know, on the upper side of slide, um, first challenge is about diversity in the region. So, you know, the individual markets um, have vastly different preferences, for example, on type of games from one another. And in addition to you know, this cultural difference, um, language is another barrier when entering the markets. Um, and there's also concern you know, around the impartiality of the legal system in some markets here. So we see many overseas game developers are trying, are very struggling with the protection of their IP, as well as uh, you know, gaming rights and secrets when, when operating in the region. And, and the last challenge I want to mention is um, around you know, local regulations. It can be quite strict um, in some countries, for example, um, it happened in Vietnam just two years ago that Apple and Google were ordered to take down you know, several games from their store um, due to illegal content. So despite all these challenges, but I have to say there are still vast opportunities um, in the region. So next slide, please, Gana. Yeah, there's, um, so uh, first on Singapore, um, you know, especially with uh, the growing, you know, regional income and improving uh, digital infrastructure as well as government um, support. Um, so in Singapore, you know, we see a lot of um, companies choose Singapore as a launch pad, even though their main audience um, is not necessarily in the country. Um, so, you know, we see that Singapore is home to some top game studios like Tencent, Riot Games, Storms, Ubisoft, etc. So you must be wondering what uh, makes Singapore an attractive regional base for these gaming companies across the world. Well, uh, first and foremost, um, it's about the ease of doing business. So in addition to strong legal system here, Singapore has um, also the lowest corporate tax rate in the region, and that is 17 percent. Um, and second is about really the um, the location and the talents. So, you know, uh, in Singapore, uh, you'll be surrounded by half a billion you know, customers within just three hours of flight. And all these surrounding countries are um, covered by Singapore's extensive trade agreements as well. And of course, you know, there's also world class education here that provides industry with skilled talents and expertise. Though um, the labor cost, I have to say, is a bit high here. And then I should probably add that we also have, you know, the highest internet penetration rate and the fastest broadband speed. And now moving on to Indonesia um, on your right hand side, uh, which is the biggest gaming market in Southeast Asia, despite its lowest internet penetration rate in the region. Uh, but the number is expecting to reach to 82% by 2026, and plus nine in 10 Indonesians are expected to have um, a mobile phone by 2025. So you can imagine um, the growth potential here with growing number of um, internet and smartphone users. And moving on um, to the Philippines, which is the fastest uh, growing market in Southeast Asia in 2022. 
So the Philippines is also the only country in the region that fully announced casino online gaming. Of course, it's licensed and regulated. And you, you might already know that English is an official language there. And the uh, Philippines has a very competitive uh, labor cost. That's why you know, local companies there are usually involved in production and post-production of games. And lastly, on Vietnam, uh, when you're seeing about Vietnam is their you know, youth population, more than half you know, Vietnam's population is under the age of 25. And then um, there's also the smartphone gen uh, penetration in Vietnam is also very high. Uh, and internet there is also much cheaper, you know, compared to other ASEAN countries, but also much slower. So the government launched a digital transformation uh, policy just last year. We see an aim to ensure that more than 80% of households in Vietnam will have access to fiber optic infrastructure by 2025. So again, you see the full of potential there in the country. Um, so this is just a very brief introduction. Um, please reach out to us, whether you're looking to uh, for collaboration partners or setting up a shop by yourself. So we have offices um, on the ground and happy to um, help with you know, market intelligence or business matching. So thank you very much. And now I will head back to Dana. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks so much for this succinct uh, presentation. Um, so I encourage everyone, so we are starting our Q&A session now, uh, so I encourage all the panelists to come back uh, to, to the screen with, the, with videos. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions that pop into your mind during the presentations, that's the right time to ask them, to send them in the Q&A box. Uh, so I can uh, already see uh, one question there, and this is probably the question to the taxation team. So there was a question, um, is there a difference between VC, IDMTC and IDMTC? In case there was IDMTC mentioned separately, that was probably something that popped into, uh, into someone's mind. So. I take that one. Basically, yeah, that's the same thing. I think IDMTC was just a short version of VC, IDMTC for this uh, uh, presentation, but there are other interactive digital media tax credit programs across Canada. So to be specific, any references was uh, was really meant for BC IDMTC. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Mark. Thanks a lot. So we, uh, we have actually received a few questions uh, during the registration stage. So we'll probably cover, start covering them first and uh, while you are sending your questions uh, in the Q&A box. Uh, so that would be probably also the question to Mark and his team. Uh, regarding the uh, any time limit on a tax credit program. So was there or is there any time limit that is associated with this uh, current program? I, I think you're referring to a program end date, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, yeah, that's pretty common for our tax credit programs to uh, sort of have that program end date. Um, uh, typically these can be a, a two year a one-year extension up to a five-year extension. Uh, the last one for BC IDMTC was a five-year extension, and I believe that's coming up in a couple of years. Uh, but really, this, um, uh, given how popular this program is uh, with industry, with uh, with um, the, the elected officials, and uh, just the success of it, uh, I don't uh, foresee any issues with um, with it not being updated. Uh, for example, I think uh, we do have a, a BC scientific and research experimental development tax credit uh, that's been around for over 20 years and it gets uh, a little booster shot of uh, two or three year extensions at a time. And it's just a, a way of um, a way of keeping these current and, and, uh, and, and putting life in them. So there is an end date, but I wouldn't be too concerned about that, like I say, due to the success and the popularity of, of this tax credit program. Okay, great. That's great, Mark. Thank you. Uh, Lisa, a question to you. Uh, so for a VC company in gaming industry, if they want to uh, enter, say, Singapore or Vietnam market, uh, what would be the, the first steps that you would recommend? So they would reach out to you and then what would be your steps that you would suggest them to do first? 
Um, so I guess it really uh, depends on, um, so what is their, um, so what, uh, so it's a publisher or developer. So normally we see most companies when they come into the market, so they normally find a partner, um, unless it's a very, you know, large company, they just set up a um, representative office here. So the first step I would suggest they do, um, so if they know what they want, it's about the gaming, so animation, so what's their type of gaming? You know, it's quite different. Um, so in different countries, even in um, ASEAN, it's quite different their preferences. So for example, one country is really, you know, the, the war gaming is very popular, but the other is animation gaming is more popular. So it depends on um, what that type of, you know, main thing, um, the gaming thing is. And then, um, so we can help is um, if they wanna, you know, set up a shop by themselves, we can walk them through about the process. If they are looking for a partner, we can also understand what they are, what their requirements are. We can also, you know, provide a list of um, some, you know, publishers, for example, or even consulting firms we have been working with. So we can definitely, you know, have a further discussion on that. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So there is a last chance to submit your questions or if someone wants to raise uh, your hand and uh, uh, ask questions live, uh, please go for it. Otherwise we are, I see that we are two minutes behind our schedule. So I just um, wanted to thank, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mark, Jessica, Michelle, Lisa, Derek, and uh, thank you everyone for attending today's webinar, uh, Discover Canada's Free Trade Agreements in East Asia and British Columbia's support to interactive digital media. So if you have any other questions or any questions that pop into your mind, please contact us at the contact details that uh, you will find uh, in our presentations. And uh, you will receive a follow-up email with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. Uh, and uh, the PDF files of the presentations, uh, along with the survey that we would appreciate if you could complete that and provide your feedback on this session. So on behalf of BC government and uh, our speakers, uh, thank you for joining us today and uh, have a great rest of your day. <laughs>